Oh, there's a bird. Oh, it's flying outside my window. And there it goes. LaCroix drinking water. I would like you to sponsor me. If you work for LaCroix, get in touch with me. A friend of mine, the very talented cinematographer Dan Katz, is over in Akron, Ohio right now. He just informed me, shooting the adaptation of the graphic novel My Friend Jeffrey Dahmer at his family home, at Dahmer's original family home. I'm assuming in Bath, Ohio. I think I actually saw it on Zillow, listed for sale not long ago. And Dan texted me, he said, of course, it's very creepy. I believe that's where the first murder was committed. Anyways, I'm getting ahead of myself here. This is gonna be a dark one, so darker than usual, maybe. So. I grew up with a lot of death. I'm very familiar with it. I've had two grandfathers pass away. I've had two fathers, both of whom I knew and loved very much, pass away. And an uncle. And several other, you know, cousins and other people here and there. Some friends from childhood. Um, yeah. A lot of people I've known have died, maybe more than usual. But I will never know what it's like to father a child. And I will never know what it's like to lose a child. And I will never know what it's like to be told that your child is responsible for the death of others. So of course, for many reasons, this is why I am interested in Lionel Dahmer's A Father's Story. This might actually be out of print. I spotted this on a bookshelf last time I was staying in New York and I couldn't believe that he had actually written something about this. I had seen some interviews with him before, the father, Lionel Dahmer, the father of Jeffrey Dahmer. And uh, I, I got really excited because, you know, after flipping through the first few pages, it didn't seem like a sensationalist true crime novel at all. This was an account of something that was deeply, deeply, deeply interesting to me on a personal level and, you know, on an objective level. I think this is a really fascinating book even if you haven't had anybody die in your family per se, or any, you know, even if you haven't been close to death, maybe especially because you haven't been close to death. I don't think he needs an introduction, but I'm going to give one just in case there's some younger folks watching. Jeffrey Dahmer, or plain old Jeff, as his dad calls him, is perhaps one of, if not the most notorious serial killer in American history. You could argue Charles Manson, but Charles Manson didn't, Charles Manson didn't actually kill anyone. He orchestrated it different. But for, you know, for notorious murders on American soil, Jeff Dahmer pretty much takes the cake. Not just for the quantity of victims, of which, you know, it's impressive, it was something like 15 or 17 or something like that, but for the quality of his crimes, their impossibly bizarre nature. Ranging from strangulation and rape to cannibalism to pouring acid into the skulls of still living victims attempting this kind of primitive version of mind control. One of those victims lived for two days. Most of them just died immediately, but can you even imagine? So you get the idea. This all came to light in, I think, 1991 in an apartment complex, in apartment 213 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He was imprisoned for life after his trial and shortly thereafter in like 94, I think, shortly after he was uh, sentenced for life, he was murdered by an inmate while he was uh, mopping a bathroom. The guy beat him to death. So. That was about six months, I think, after this book was published. I'm not sure if this is out of print or not. I found a copy online and it wasn't that difficult and it wasn't that expensive and you might be able to find a PDF version online. But uh, yeah, I, I might get one quick because you know I'm not sure if it'll be around. Of course, after they figured out that Jeff Dahmer was the killer, then it was a huge media sensation internationally. Jeffrey Dahmer, the name and concept, has since become this legendary figure of complete, total, inexplicable, profound, true evil. And we have to remember something. He was a child. He was a really sweet kid, apparently. Nobody knows this better than uh, his father, Lionel Dahmer. Ugh. I'm happy to be doing this review because this is kind of a rough world to spend some time in, just like, um, 
I think I used to be far less sensitive to this material when I was around, you know, 15, 16, 17. Uh, I think I was far more interested in extreme, you know, extreme uh, stories or films or books and uh, violence and, um, you know, serial killers or, uh, you know, whatever, you know, just give me everything, give me as much as I can take, let me see what the limits are. But uh, as I get older, I'll tell you, it's bizarre. You think you become hardened, but actually you become more sensitive, I believe, because your, um, your emotional range is greater, I think. And uh, that always kind of surprises me and takes me off guard in some cases. But that's why I think I truly do uh, believe that this is a great book and a seriously valuable insight that uh, many of us just otherwise would never ever have. That's the wonderful thing about literature, you see. And just the same about modern technology, right? We're able to understand and systematically track the processes and analyze this, this information, and at the same time to marvel at the impossibility of comprehension of some, of some subjects, much more so than previous generations. It would be impossible, for example, to understand the life and times or the mental processes of Gilles de Rey or Elizabeth Bathory, you know, these very mystical, kind of legendary, shrouded figures who have supposedly committed some of the worst, you know, atrocities in history. Nobody really knows anything. We weren't really able to measure. We don't know. Nobody really was able to get any facts down. But for this, we were able to see the whole thing just expand, and we were able to dwell on it. And it's it's right out in the open for everybody to see. And subsequently, you know, most of the serial killers of the 20th century, you know, those who were caught. And again, like I just said, nobody knows about this better than his father. And to the best of my knowledge, none of the fathers of any of the other major, you know, famous, let's face it, serial killers uh, came forth to discuss it so openly like he did. And I think that's very courageous. Very courageous. Really, really, really ballsy. Nobody knows why Jeffrey Dahmer did the things he did. Nobody knows. He's not a sympathetic character, except when he was. He didn't do nice things, except when he did. He was as difficult and as impossible to comprehend as it is often for me. A human, like you and like me. And we are radically different from him, like Lionel's co-worker says to him after it's come out in the media, only for the grace of God. And that's terrifying. Do you remember that video like way back in the early 2000s for uh, this song called Stan by that hip hop artist Eminem? It was about this crazy stalker fan who keeps writing letters to Eminem who is singing the song and Eminem doesn't answer him and so he gets really angry and he drives his car off of a bridge into the water and uh, his girlfriend, his pregnant girlfriend is locked in the trunk and the song is lyrically designed to switch back and forth between the fan and Eminem. It's really this creepy, creepy, you know, uh, setup, which is actually, that one actually kind of held up over time, I realized. And of course, within the song, by the last verse, you know, it's, it's Eminem, and he realizes that uh, he knows about that news, and he knows who the fan was, and who he's actually sitting down to write the letter to, that he's responding to in that very moment, and then the song ends, you know, so. When Jeffrey Dahmer's stepmother is reading the prison mail that's being sent to him from all of these people all over the world, all about these crimes that he did, the sheer range of sane to crazy, of lonely and desperate to psychotic, is emotionally overwhelming to say the least. Not, it doesn't even do it justice. And, then, and there's this wonderful scene in the book after all of this has gone down where she's just reading these letters out loud in the car and Jeff's dad is just driving on the highway, just sort of like emotionally numb, just totally vacant. Very, very cinematic scene in the book. If you molest a child or you rape someone or you murder one or two or three people, even if you shoot up a school or shoot up a nightclub or... Uh, drive a car or a truck into some people. You're certainly deemed a piece of shit by those who know you. But, and I hate to say this because it's so bizarre, those crimes are so common now 
They are so common that you are really nothing special. And you will probably be, I can only hope, prosecuted and locked away from civilized society. That's tier one of the killers. That's tier one of being a murderer, right? And you really don't get that much recognition because it's, let's be honest, fairly uncreative. I know that's kind of sick, but you know, stay with me on this one. But then you move on to tier two, right? You kill a lot of people. You kill a lot of people in like one big fell swoop. Unabomber, Osama bin Laden, maybe some ISIS shit, maybe a small genocide in a war-torn, impoverished nation somewhere. Something that we can, amazingly, shrug off and deal with. And in the coming decades, you know, your name might be tossed around. You might be brought up, but, you know, I don't think, you know, the kids in 20 years are going to be afraid if somebody says that name. They're going to be like, who's that? We're going to skip tier three for a second and go to tier four, which is like, you know, Hitler, Mussolini, Stalin, Mao, the big guys, right? People who have been responsible for so many deaths that their name and image has basically been like reduced to a concept. It's basically like an idea. The only human thing about it is that there's like a face to it. Other than that, it resembles nothing next to like what they actually were as people because it's so big, so gargantuan. It is essentially virtually inhuman. To some degree, the same thing goes for tier two. Tier one remains human. Tier Tier two and four, maybe not so much, more conceptual at that point. The way the media digests it, the way we, the way it exists in our culture, it seems. Tier three, this, this is the category of people who have killed a great deal of people, but have done it creatively. They've taken lives and they've hurt and maimed and raped and murdered in a manner that is so deeply intrinsically personal and utterly individual and seemingly obviously morally reprehensible but also seemingly um, uh, uh, whatever the word is without without regret you know so much so that they've become legends society for the next 50 years will know their names you know maybe for the rest of time who knows if they're still alive, they take on a celebrity status. They take on a cult, you know, status. They're universally hated, it is assumed, and then quite oddly, there's this whole other significant pocket of possibly mentally ill individuals who positively love them. And in addition, popular culture owes them a heavy debt for entertainment and as an eternal source of fascination and creative content. They're viewed as almost a limit, as a bar set. As a limit, there's that word again, limits. And it always comes back to these things. It always comes back to death, death and eroticism. What is the connection? What is the connection between death and eroticism? Georges Bataille described eroticism as assenting to life up until the point of death. I'm going to come back to that for the rest of this channel's existence for many reasons, some of which you'll soon discover. So right, what is the connection there, and what is the difference, fundamentally, which we all want to know. It's why we, why we read the book, why we watch the news, and why we, you know, why we ask why. What is the difference between you and I and Jeffrey Dahmer? That's fundamentally the question that his father has to ask, right? Is there a difference between you and I and Jeffrey Dahmer, or is it just pure bad luck? Personally, after reading this, it feels as though it's something along the lines of him having nothing to lose, to some degree. And this is what I mean by that. He was already a bumbling failure in every single thing that life told him was the right thing to do. In the role as a son, in the role as a heterosexual man, certainly as a sober human being, if you get my drift. He was constantly apologizing not only to his father, but to everyone for everything. So is it any wonder that the only thing that awoke any sort of passion, any sort of drive within him, that the only thing that contained any sort of emotional or sexual or physical intensity would be the thing that he leapt onto, would be that thing that he dutifully followed unconsciously like a shark follows blood. Back to Bataille for a moment, who I, I absolutely love. You guys already know that and I will review him eventually in the future, but you can, you know, He's the most interesting, personally, to me. There is an idea that he had that is related to the intensity of the erotic experience or love. Love itself. 
something wherein it's impossible without death, or more directly, the fear or the threat of death. The other day, my girlfriend and I were walking in downtown Los Angeles, and there was this liberal group down there doing some sort of liberal shit, and they were all wearing these t-shirts that said, Fear Less, Love More. And that made me go right back to Bataille's idea. Bataille's idea came flooding back into my consciousness at that very moment, and it stuck with me for the rest of the afternoon. You don't love necessarily because it's the right thing or whatever. You love because you fear death. Love exists because you fear death, because of the threat of death, because we're all going to die. And the stronger you fear that death, the stronger your fear, the stronger the love. This is a theory. I have no idea how to prove this to you. I don't know if it can be. I don't think it can. You want to say, for example, you only love something when you can let it go. I don't know about that. I don't think that's true. I always thought that love was a prioritizing of something before you, and loving someone else is impossible without self-love or self-respect. But letting go in the way of death? I don't think so. Think about that for a second. If nobody died, what need would there be for love? Y'all gonna be around? I'll see you motherfuckers in like the next 50 years. It'll be like yesterday. You get so sick of each other that it'd be like nothing but absolute misery. Think about that. Think about heaven. Think about going and having to hang out with assholes for eternity. Eunuchs playing harps. That's somebody's idea of heaven. That's a very popular conception of heaven. <laughs> Forever. So long live death. Without death, love is impossible. It's a very simple consolidation of an idea by George Bataille. You heard it from me. Without death, love is impossible. I do think that's true. I think that is fundamentally true. Anyways, taken to a whole new extreme, nowhere does that concept come in stronger than in the life of Jeffrey Dahmer. This is, of course, you know, him taking it to a whole new level. That is, assuming that he had any capacity to love another human being any kind of semblance of love, whatever kind, you know, unless he was just acting the entire time, acting what people who love are supposed to do, what the lines are, just saying the lines and going by throughout life, you know, really not feeling anything like it. Lustful obsession may be more appropriate. The idea of him actually loving any of his victims is dubious. This is kind of the way somebody lusts after a physical form of a man or a woman or like, you know, kind of the way a dog lusts after raw meat. It's speculated in books and films and television, but again, speculated that there may have been some sort of like emotional desire for these dead bodies, right? Where normal people wanted it from conscious living human beings, Jeffrey Dahmer wanted them to be as close to, if not, dead. He wanted total control. By all rights, he seemed to be terrified of life and existence itself, almost in like a Lovecraftian way. Because existence for him was synonymous with an enormous, enormous, unfathomable, cataclysmically, abysmally dull failure. Thus, you could put this really dark, romantic, or poetic spin on it, where this guy was so devastatingly lonely that in order to feel as though he wouldn't be abandoned, he needed to kill his victims and keep them. He needed to keep them somehow, and this meant everything from murdering them and raping their corpses, to the aforementioned, plus consuming them, to have them quite literally be a part of him. And Lionel addresses this, because he sees fears of abandonment in himself, of course. Like most of us, I think, to some degree. Although that degree has a, a wide range, obviously. If we are to learn or take away anything. This dread of people leaving him had been at the root of more than one of Jeff's murders. In general, Jeff had simply wanted to keep people permanently, to hold them fixedly within his grasp. He had wanted to make them literally a part of him, a permanent part, utterly inseparable from himself. It was a mania that had begun with fantasies of unmoving bodies, and proceeded to his practice of drugging men in bathhouses, and then on to murder, and finally to cannibalism, by which, by which practice Jeff had hoped to ensure that his victims would never leave him, that they would be part of him forever. In my own life, I realized that I had had the same extreme fear of abandonment, a fear so deep that it had generated a great deal of otherwise inexplicable behavior. And then it goes on to, you know, he gives examples of this. And much of the book is 
like this, identifying the extreme traits of his son's personality or um, constitution and identifying uh, the shadows of it within himself. So all speculation, all theories, all religious beliefs, all philosophizing aside, how the fuck does a father deal with this? How does one even begin to confront the fact that they are responsible for somebody who is called the most sadistically evil person in the world? How do you even begin? What Lionel did was reflect and analyze. He was a scientist. So now he stepped into this role and he carries with him from that life all of these analytical skills with which to examine his son, himself, his relationship, you know, life in general, and a really, really beautiful and insightful book has actually come out of it. Of course, he asks the reasons why his son would do something like what he did, and, and what he comes up with at the end, like I said, is a huge question mark, which perhaps is the most terrifying thing of all, of course. As you'll read and can see in the interviews, which are myriad all over, including like one with Oprah, um, he didn't abuse his son, he wasn't violent with him, and Jeff, to the best of his knowledge, didn't suffer any sort of physical or sexual abuse when he was growing up. In this book, he tries to see, in what were fairly typical events for any young person's life, any sort of hints or details or clues to what was to come, right? And then, of course, everything is mired in the events that happen then, you know, you can... You can see it anywhere, and you have to question it back and forth. And though the book is touching, this story of this father and son, so similar in their demeanor, and manner of avoiding conflict and apologizing, and being analytical, and manner of avoiding conflict, both predisposed to apologizing for everything, or being too polite, of having the same deep-rooted desire for control, and both having the analytical prowess to determining the best method to take it, at the end, we are still left with this big... There's this great scene after they meet him, after he's been arrested and he's, uh, he's in jail for these crimes. He thought for a moment, as if going over the events of the last few days, and then rolled up his eyes toward the ceiling. I really messed up. Yes, but Sherry and I will stand by you, Jeff. Sorry, he said again, but with that same deadness and lack of emotion. He didn't seem to comprehend the enormous consequences of what he had done. Sorry, he repeated. Sorry? But for what? For the men he had killed? For the anguish of their relatives? For the torment of his grandmother? For the ruin of his own family? There was no way to tell exactly what Jeff was sorry for. It was at that precise moment that I actually glimpsed the full character of my son's madness. Saw it physically, as if it were a scar across his face. It was impossible to tell whom he felt sorry for, or what he really felt sorry about. He couldn't even imitate regret, much less truly feel it. Remorse was beyond him, and he could probably sense it only as an emotion felt by people in another galaxy. He was beyond the call of a role, incapable of acting a part. His sorry was a mummified remain, an artifact retained from that distant time, when he'd still been able to sense, if only to imitate, a normal range of feelings. Suddenly I thought of Jeff's childhood and his general remoteness no longer looked like shyness, but like disconnection, the opening of an unbridgeable abyss. His eyes no longer struck me merely as expressionless, but as utterly void. Beyond the call of the most basic forms of sympathy and understanding, beyond even the capacity to ape such emotions, as he stood before me at that instant, my son, perhaps for the first time in his adult life, presented himself to me as he really was, destitute of feeling, his emotions shaved down to a bare minimum, a young man who was deeply, deeply ill and for whom, in all likelihood, there was no way out. Jeff will kill himself, I thought with a strange certainty. No one can live like this. A few minutes later, Jeff was led away, still walking in the same rigid posture, his hands cuffed in front of him. No one can live like this. I repeated in my mind, and yet in a sense, as I was increasingly to discover over the next few months, I too had lived like this. A man who found it hard to express his emotions, who focused on the minutia of social life and often lost track of its overall design, 
who relied on others to direct his responses to life because he could not trust his own sense of the way it really worked. A man whose son was perhaps only the deeper, darker shadow of himself. It's not the answers to the questions that make this book profound. It's not the answers in life that make life profound. You know, there are none. There's none. Sorry. Not really sorry. It's the fact that his dad still supported him. That is what is profound. After everything he's done, he truly embodied the idea of what most parents claim to but probably don't. And that is unconditional love. Unconditional love. Throughout Jeff Dahmer's failures, including his alcoholism and his first crime of molesting a child, his father still tried to help him. He never gave up believing that there was some sort of possible redemption in some capacity, however minuscule. For him, a sudden, uncontrollable act of violence and sexual mutilation had thrust any hope for an ordinary life into a world that was utterly beyond his grasp. How odd and unrealizable all my talk of college and careers must have struck him after that, my ambitions for him, the little strategies I suggested for getting his life on track, must have seemed like constructs from another planet. My system of values, built as it was on notions of work and family, like quaint but incomprehensible artifacts, from a vanished civilization. There were good times too, times when Jeff was healthy and vigorous and full of fun. We went to parades and festivals and Ames had its own small zoo, which we occasionally visited. I set up a swing set beside our house and made a sandbox for Jeff to play in when the weather was such that he could stay outdoors. Through it all, Jeff remained a happy, ebullient child. When I arrived at home for supper, he would come rushing to me and jump into my arms. He was eager and expressive and he loved to play and be read to in the evening. He played with large blocks now and rode a small tricycle. Even more, he loved for me to take him riding on a bicycle, his body seated on the chrome handlebars. On one of these rides, Jeff suddenly demanded that I stop immediately. He was quite excited, his eyes very wide, as he fixed them on something I could not make out. When I brought the bicycle to a halt, he pointed up ahead and to the right. Look, he said, look at that. What? I asked, still unable to see what he was pointing at. It's right there, Jeff cried. I looked more closely in the direction he indicated and saw a small mound that looked like little more than a clump of dirt. When I drew closer, I saw that it was a nighthawk that had fallen from its nest and now lay helplessly on the hard pavement. We parked the bike and went closer. At first, we didn't know what to do, but at Jeff's urging, I picked it up and together we took it home. Over the next few weeks, we nursed it to health, feeding it a mixture of milk and corn syrup, which we served by means of a baby bottle. After a time, the bird took solid food, bread, and finally bits of hamburger. It grew larger and larger, and we finally took it outside to release it. It was a bright spring day, and I can still remember how green everything looked. I cradled the bird in my cupped hand, lifted it into the air, and then opened my hand and let it go. As it spread its wings and rose into the air, we, all of us, Joyce, Jeff, and myself, felt a wonderful delight. Jeff's eyes, Jeff's eyes were wide and gleaming. It may have been the single happiest moment of his life. It's a very, very sad story. Could be up your alley, could not. I mean, always remember what Jeff Dahmer said. There's no accounting for taste. Ah, I had to get one. I had to get one Dahmer joke in there. You have to laugh at the sick, sad world. Nothing matters and it's fabulous. Always remember that life is too short to read bullshit. That's all I got for you guys today. Talk to you soon. Have a great week. Ciao!